We mm. don't want to surround ourselves with mini me. So I'm not saying, you know, they have to look just like you, think just like you, feel just like you. I mean, the people who give me honest feedback are oftentimes very different from me in many ways, except with one exception, that they're willing to go on the journey as well, right? So the leaders that I see who are building highly engaged, highly connected, highly successful organizations are those who want truth tellers, truth tellers around them, and people who are also willing to be open with their stuff. Um, we don't want to be around people who are careless with us. This is the Brandon Smith Show, and of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith, and the entire purpose of the show is one singular thing, and that is to help you live a life that much more free from dysfunction. So for our show today, we're going to talk about what leaders can do to not only take care of themselves, but even really create that, that mindset and that environment for everyone else. And it really starts with them as leaders. And so we're going to talk about this important combination of mindfulness and connection for leaders. How do they become more mindful and build the right kinds of connections? What is, and what does connection really mean? So to help us on this journey, I have the wonderful pleasure of having Karen Hardwick be kind of our, our guest and guru for the day. Karen, really good to see you. Oh, it's good to be here. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really excited about this topic as we talked about the topic and you took a deeper dive into it. Mm -hmm. As we were just preparing for the show, I thought, oh my gosh, there's so much richness in here. And so um, I definitely want to dive in. But before we do that, I would love it for you to share a little bit more about you and your journey and the kind of work you do with the audience. Um, but just to make sure I get your title right. So you're CEO of the Karen J. Hardwick Incorporated company, business, firm, right? That's right. Yeah. So tell That's us a little right. bit more about, about the kind of work you do and what, what got you to this place. So we are trusted advisors to senior level executives and their teams, their organizations, helping them to understand what their strengths are and how to be a more effective leader from a very transformative, um, deeply rich place within themselves. So we believe that all leadership starts with the leader themselves. Mm. And so we have a very holistic approach to leadership. And how I got in this is I was first studying to be an Episcopal priest. Mm. So I was in seminary. And then I went on to get my master's in clinical social work, was a psychotherapist for many years, went into corporate America, and about 18 years ago started the firm. So we have, we're a boutique firm. We have clients all over the globe, and I think we have the best job in the whole world. Yeah, it sounds like yeah. really interesting. You get to work with all these individual leaders and help them get, gain that self-awareness, but then become even better, which is a true gift. So let's, let's talk about this. I'm going to let you guide the conversation in terms of where you'd like to start. Okay. We have mindfulness and we have connection. Um, since you're kind of the expert in this, I'm not sure which one we would, which one goes in the right order or or where we should really start. So wh where would you think yeah. is, the, is the natural starting place for this? Yeah, so I really believe that we can't connect with or lead others unless we really know how to connect with ourselves, Brandon. Mm. And that's, as you know, I mean, that's a lifelong journey. How do we connect with ourselves? What do we learn about ourselves? How do we leverage our strengths? Um, how do we accept and acknowledge our derailers? Because I have seen over and over again, you probably have too, that when we don't understand what our derailers are and the impact of those on others, our derailers go into the basement and work out with weights. I, I love mean, that image. I think that's such a great <laughs> image. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's true, right? Yeah. That which we deny gets louder. Mm because it's just clamoring for attention and it starts to show up in all kinds of dysfunctional ways. Yeah. So I think in order to connect with ourselves, we have to have a lot of courage because we have to look at the whole person that we are. And so mindfulness from where we sit, from where I sit in our experience, right shotgun with connection because mm. mindfulness is a great way to deepen the connection first with ourselves, also with a higher power or a purpose and then with others. So how do we start that process? If you're working with a leader, obviously we all have our own derailers. We all have our strengths and our derailers. I mean, they were human beings. 
Um, but not necessarily everyone has done this kind of work. They haven't really kind of gone down to the basement to see what's working out down there. No, it's kind of dark down yeah, there. It's kind of dark down there. So how do you, so how do you, how, what's a starting place for us? How do we yeah. open that concept and start to explore that? I think we're all looking for a safe container, right? Hmm. A container in which we can truly open the basement door, take a few st steps down those stairs, maybe turn on the light a little bit and see what lurks down there in the darkness. But in order for us to do that, we have to have some kind of a safe place to process what we're learning. So the kind hmm. of work that we do starts by creating that safe container for leaders. And regardless of why we're brought in to work with an executive, and you know this, or an organization or a team, the symptoms are all from where I sit, symptoms of disconnection. Mm. I mean, we're not brought in to, ha to help senior executives really learn how to be an executive. I mean, they have those functional skills. Those are table stakes. What we're brought in to do is to really help somebody live their best life and to do so in the workplace, but also to do so personally, and to really start to create this inspiring workforce culture so that everybody can be more innovative and can be more focused on doing the kind of work that they really want to do. So I think we really have to look to find ways to create a safe container for ourselves and for each other in which we can have the conversations and do the digging deep that we need to do in order to look at all of who we are. Yeah, so you, that makes a lot of sense, kind of finding that, creating that safe space so people mm -hmm. are comfortable to explore all, as, all aspects and facets of right. who they are. Right, right. Um, as you were speaking, we've used this word connection a few times. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a nice kind of way of looking at that word. It's more than just connecting with another person. Right. So maybe let's go down that path a little bit. When you think okay. about that word connection, what does that mean to you? What it means to me is that there's an emotional and a mental and a spiritual synergy that we develop in order to really start to accept every aspect of ourself. Mm. And so there are ways to do that. Um, it's about learning how to be mindful in the moment. Mm accept what we're feeling, accept what we're thinking. We don't have to act on it, but just to be aware of how it is that I'm showing up. What emotions do I have? What cognitive processes do I have? So there's this whole sense of just be here now. And then in uh -huh. order to be here now, there are different things that we can do. Um, most of my C-level mm. executives, vice presidents as well, senior executives are starting to meditate in the morning. And if they're not actually meditating officially, they have some kind of silence, some kind of solitude, some kind of self-reflective practice that they do on a regular basis because I like to say morning sets the tone. If what we do is the first thing we get up, we look at our emails, we're rushing out the door, we're barking a few things at the kids or at our spouse, what kind of tone does that set for the rest of the day? So if we look at the research, Brandon, that says we're wired to connect, and there's tons of neurological research doing, being done right now that says we're as wired to connect as we need water and air. So mm. our, all of our neural pathways are determined by the information that's coming in and what profoundly impacts that is the quality of connections that we have. So if we're surrounded by emotionally whole people, mentally fit people, spiritually strong people, our neural pathways then are producing cognitive patterns and behavioral patterns that help us to have healthy responses. Okay, so this is makes a really interesting okay. chicken or the egg question. Okay. So I, I, I love that idea. Like we, we want to be surrounding ourselves with these really healthy whole people. So the chicken or the egg question yeah. is, do, is it our responsibility to help create that in others around us or do we need to go find others like that? Well, that's cool. You so know, ask you know me I mean? again so, so like, I get the question. So, okay. So uh -huh. I'm going to take it from like, we, we've got this leader. Okay. And we're working with her, we're working with him. And then um, they're starting to really get it. 
and they're seeing what connection means. They're seeing how to be um, operate at a different level. And so now we're saying we want to surround yourself with people also operating at the same level. So they've got this leadership team around them that is not operating at that level. So is their job? So they is their job to help elevate them, or is their job to go find more people like them, or okay. is it a, or is it a little right. bit of both? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. We work with this company that decided about seven years ago that what they wanted to do was to create an, an entire uptick in their culture. And to, they determined that they wanted to focus on five main behaviors, all about connection, empathy, curiosity, mm. things that drive high performance. We know that, things that drive engagement. And so what they did is we put their top leaders through a year-long training on connection and the seven attributes that we believe go hand in hand with that. Now, nice. not, not all of their leaders, even those who went through that, were willing to do that work. It's not that they were bad people or inept people. It's just that through the process, they decided this really isn't for me. Yeah. This is hard. I might be ready to do this five years from now, but I'm certainly not ready to do this now. So the interesting thing was the invitation was given, Brandon. People mm -hmm. participated. Some really got into it. Engagement scores went up. Productivity, profitability went up. And some people self-selected out which then allowed the organization to start hiring to these attributes that were so important to them. So then there was an entire assessment process around the hiring of people who could then start right out of the gate with these kinds of attributes. So when we think about this whole thing of mindfulness and connection and kind of getting leaders to operate that way, are there certain parts of that process that you find are the hardest where you do see some leaders? It's almost like someone might want to, Wanting to be a doctor and they know organic chemistry is like the deal breaker, right? right. It's either I pass it and I'm going to be a doctor or I don't pass it and I'm not going to be a doctor. Is there a certain part in this process where you say, oh yeah, if you can clear that, you're, you're likely going to get there. But if you can't, this might not be something that is a path you're ready to take right now. So here's what I think. I don't think there's a right or wrong to this, but over the years, I've learned that one of the most important things for that is the ability to be rigorously self-honest. Mm. And that's really difficult. We have to be able to accept what we are dealing with inside of ourself really deep down. I mean, we all have behaviors that we pretty much created to survive trauma or hurt or loss in our life. And they might have served us at one time, and then we've got to jettison them. We've got to shift. We've got to be able to do something differently because they're not serving us well anymore. So it really helps for us to have some process in our life that can help us be rigorously self-honest. I mean, the 12 steps talks about that a whole lot, yeah. but so do therapists and so do executive coaches who are into this holistic approach. And wow. we really need people who are going to be able to help us accept give us feedback. And that's what mindfulness does. I mean, right? It's, it's about being present in the moment, accepting whatever is without judgment. Yeah. So I love that idea of being rigorously, rigorously self-honest. Is that right? Yes. Rigorously self-honest. Yes. Am I saying that right? Yes, you are. Okay, good. Um, except I thought about that uh, on why that's so challenging for leaders yes. in particular. And I want to, I want to ask you about it. Okay right after the break cool okay so all tight we're going to go to break when we come back and we'll take this we're going to continue on this conversation of mindfulness and connection and uh i'm going to ask karen this question so stay tuned here's your coaching minute for the week presented to you by the leadership foundry Dysfunction in the workplace, it's a pervasive problem. Here's a simple tip to eliminate dysfunction, both in your team, but even in the environments around you. Clarify your team members' roles, 
goals, and responsibilities. So just spend some time thinking about, does all of my team know? Does each of them know what their role is, what the goals are of the team, and their responsibilities? If the answer is yes. You right there eliminate 50% of the, all the dysfunction that could come up in your team. If the answer is no. Think about how you could do that better. When we don't do that, one of two things happens. Either people overlap work and they step on each other's toes, or you have one person carrying much bigger load while a couple other people are hanging out not doing near as much work. It's one of the big problems in the nonprofit world is a lack of clarity around roles, goals, and responsibilities. So focus on those three things, and I promise you, not only will you eliminate dysfunction, it's going to make your workplace that much more enjoyable. Welcome back from break. Of course, this is the Brandon Smith Show. And right before the break, we were talking about mindfulness, connection. We talked about some of the challenges to really, truly live that out as a leader. And Karen, I posed to you that question, like what's the big kind of that moment, like the organic chemistry kind of a litmus test for leaders. And you said kind of being rigorously self-honest, you know, being able to look at the stuff that's maybe not so pretty. And what, as you were talking, what was kind of firing through my brain was all the interesting research, some not so good, like there's higher levels of uh, narcissism in leadership, right? Because yes. narcissists only look at the, like they don't look at the negative bad stuff. They kind of ignore that, right? And then I was, you know, all of a sudden my brain flipped over to another weird place. <laughs> and I thought about, you know, when they would talk about, um, I'm a big baseball fan, so you have to bear with me. But when they talk about successful closers, the, the people who come in at the end of a game and they close a game, they say they have to have a short memory to be effective. Okay. In other words, that you can't you can't linger on the fact I just gave up eight runs last night because I've got to come out again tonight. I got to pretend like that never happened. Right. So it's interesting because almost to be successful, you have to spend more time on positive self talk and telling yourself and and locking away all those mistakes and all those not so good behaviors to help you be successful. I would think, um, and yet that can be a derailer by itself because that leads to more narcissism, et cetera. So it was more of an observation. Um, how, do you, how do you wrestle with that when you're dealing with an executive who, you know, they, they, are, they do a lot of positive self-talk and that's probably what got them there. And now you're saying, okay, but we should look at the whole picture. Is that, is that a difficult conversation to have with them or do they seem pretty receptive to that? It depends on who they are. I'm thinking mm. of a CEO of a um, Fortune 100 company I was talking to a few years back when I had to give him the results of his live 360. Mm. And he literally said to me, um, what difference does it make? Do you have any idea how much money I make? Do you have any idea what our share price is at? So he was going to all the externals, which were pretty impressive, of course, to let me know that regardless of what the feedback was going to be, to him it wasn't going to make any difference. So what I said to him was, but you don't know what you're leaving on the table. Mm. Things could even be perhaps better if you were to open yourself up to the feedback. Look at it. And that's, I think, one of the things that leaders can really start to look at is how can I forgive myself? How can I be self-compassionate? Because we all have things we need to work on, regardless of how we might be at the top of our game. And those are the leaders who, from a sustainable perspective, really start to create a legacy that's about transformation and makes people lead a much better life. Okay, so I think you just built our bridge. And, okay. that's, and that's forgiveness. Uh -huh. Like forgiving oneself. So it's not ignoring... No. that I just gave up eight runs last night. Uh, it's not pretending that didn't happen, but it's somehow um, coming to terms with that, but, and, but not letting it anchor me, not being stuck in it either. Coming to terms and moving on in a productive way. Yeah, exactly. Letting that not be the albatross. Okay, sorry, so, that, so, that, so that's the answer. Okay. Okay, so how do we get there? <laughs> I keep on going back to connection, right? Yeah. I mean... Forgiveness is a lifelong journey. We all have things that nip at our heels, that are hard to forgive. 
And I think it's who we surround ourselves with. What kind of tribe do we have? Mm -hmm. Do we have a tribe that helps us to understand, you know, forgiveness is the path to acceptance. And we really can't be present to anybody else. Our team, our direct reports, our shareholders, our board, until we really can show up in a compassionate way to ourselves. It sounds kind of woo-woo, but it's not because these are the organizations, Bain did some research, Bain and company did some research a few years back that showed out of 33 leadership traits, what impacts performance, connection, and engagement the most was mindfulness. The ability to show up and be completely present to whatever was going on, including what was going on inside of you, without judgment and an attitude of openness. It drives so much. Yeah. So you made a a, a quick comment in there, but I think it's a really important one I want to go back to. And you said part of what allows us to do that is surrounding ourselves with the right tribe. Yes. Yes. So if someone's listening to this right now, I can imagine they'd be asking themselves this question because this, that person listening is me sitting right here, okay? Yeah. And I'm asking this question. How do, you th- how do you assemble the right tribe? What are the kinds of people that you need to be looking for? And are we talking professional tribe, personal tribe, a little bit of all that? I'd be curious as to when you've seen people do that well, what, what is that kind of makeup? I think, Brandon, it starts with people who are also willing to be rigorously self-honest. We Mm. don't want to surround ourselves with mini-me's, so I'm not saying, you know, they have to look just like you, think just like you, feel just like you. I mean, the people who give me honest feedback are oftentimes very different from me in many ways, except with one exception, that they're willing to go on the journey as well. Right. So the leaders that I see who are building highly engaged, highly connected, highly successful organizations are those who want truth tellers, truth tellers around them and people who are also willing to be open with their stuff. Um, We don't want to be around people who are careless with us. Mm. We don't want to be constantly talking about our journey or how we're going to raise our game or what we're working on or what our contribution was as to why the brand strategy didn't go the way it was supposed to go and have other people not be as open as we are. So that whole tribe thing means we want people who are working on themselves, who are emotionally whole, mentally healthy, mindful, spiritually strong, whatever that means for them. So I think it's really about deepening that connection with everybody in our life and also figuring out how to draw boundaries when we have people who are taking energy away from us, who are not willing to go on that ride with us. Okay. I do. Oh, absolutely. I want to go to that in a minute. But one other observation I had in this before we move off the tribe one, what struck me was um, back when I used to teach more regularly um, at Emory in the business school for the Fulton MBAs and even the exec MBAs, I would always say, you know, you, you want to find your trusted advisors, mm-hmm. but you want to find them right now. Look to the person to your left and right. You don't want to wait till you're a C-level executive and then start looking for trusted advisors because there's politics at stake. You, you, you may have a position of more power than them and they don't want to tell you something that uh, they think you don't want to hear. Find those people now and grow with them. So it struck me that was, you know, um, it reminded me of that conversation because yeah. it, I could imagine it would be hard if you're trying to do this for the first time and you're the CEO and now you're telling everyone to be honest with you. They may say, I, I, I'll be kind of honest. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think, you know, as you said, it's really important for us to develop trusted advisors who are not even in the organization, who are outside of the organization, who might be childhood friends or somebody that we went to graduate school with or somebody who lives next door to us. They have to be people who are willing to show up um, and also people who believe that there's no outside solution to an inside problem. We have to continually go within ourselves in order to show up with our best self. Yeah, yeah. So then those, the final comment you gave earlier was around this idea of knowing when to, I can't remember exactly the beautiful way you said it, but it was essentially when people are drawing, taking energy away from you, mm-hmm. 
being able to recognize that and, and whether to put healthy boundaries up or whatever that is. So how do we know that? What are some tools or tips you could give people who are listening that would be indicators that someone is more of a drainer and taker than a giver? So a few things. One is I think it's really important that we're mindful about how we feel after being with somebody or while we're being with somebody. Is, it, is this a comfortable connection? Do we kind of feel um, on edge? Do we feel like we're walking on eggshells? Is it a relationship where we're constantly apologizing and they don't take any responsibility for something that's going mm. wrong? Is this something where they're blaming instead of accepting their part? So that's, I always look for, are they gaslighting? Are they trying to convince us that we're wrong when really they misstepped? So that's really important to pay attention to those, that kind of input. The other thing is, are they open with themselves? Are they open about themselves? Are they showing up in a consistent way? Are they doing what they said they were going to do? Um, are they looking to us to rescue them, fix things? Yeah. I so mean, the list can go on, so on Sounds like a nice big list of unhealthy boundaries. And I would say, I, would, I almost would think, because I've been in situations similar to that, and, um, that the first indicator would be, if this person is constantly on your mind for whatever reason, ask yourself why. Yeah. And then it might dig down to one of those other things. Because yeah. they're doing something that's pulling on you or pushing on you that's causing you to either question yourself or um, think about them more, giving them more of that mental energy and, and more of that mind share than you really want to. That's a really interesting way of putting it. It's kind of like they take up real estate in your brain. Yeah, yeah. and you're constantly you're like thinking squatters. about them. Yeah, uh -huh. and then you're like, what? So, but so, the key, yeah. the, so the next step would be, why am I constantly thinking about them? And then that leads to, is it gaslighting? Is it um, lack of responsibility? Is it... Um, lack of ownership mm -hmm. are they are they manipulating me some way are they backstabbing me am I worried or fearful or are they creating anxiety in me that can lead to all those other your very precise uh, labels for that behavior well and that happens in the workplace right all the time oh, I, all I, the that's time. what I was thinking I mean right I'm, naturally I'm sure we've all had experiences like that in personal relationships um, amen but uh, yeah. Those kinds of dynamics happen in the workplace in, in the ways you just outlined. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Karen, this has been an absolute joy. So I ask all of my guests this question. Yeah. If, um, what's one life hack you might have for us to help us live a life more free from dysfunction, either personally or professionally? One life hack. I would say have um, spend more time around the table. Okay, so say more. Spend more time around the table. One of the, one of the greatest joys of my life is to have people sitting around my table having an awesome meal and connecting. And we just don't do that enough these days. So it's kind of like communion. Yeah. It's communion and telling stories and having great food and drinking whatever they want to drink and just really having this great time. And it's such an antidote to the disconnection in the world today. Yeah, love that. It's a beautiful picture. Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to learn more about you and your firm, where can they go? So they can go to KarenJHardwick.com. We're on Facebook under Karen J. Hardwick, Inc. We're on LinkedIn. Um, and that's just where they can reach us. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Brandon. It was an absolute gift. I, absolutely, I, I learned a lot, oh. and it really got me thinking differently about many of the leaders even that I work with. So I, I really I really appreciate your oh, time. Oh, it's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah. yeah. And thank you all for listening and, and watching the show. Of course, catch a new show every Sunday when we drop a new one on Facebook Live. Uh, and if you're uh, not listening to the show uh, via podcast, well, why not? You should be. So download it either on Stitcher or iTunes. And once you've done that, please rate and review the show. That's how more people find the show. We grow our tribe and we really take up the fight against workplace and life dysfunction. So until our next show, have a great week and an awesome life.